A very warm welcome to you all, wherever you are joining us from. This is Foundstone Conversations, and I'm Andrew Bird, your host for today. We'll uh, give it a, a couple of minutes uh, to let everyone file in. It's, uh, we've, we've had some interesting uh, registrations from all sorts of different countries, so it'd be actually great to, in the chat, if you could jot in there uh, where you're joining us from. It could be somewhere in Australia or New Zealand, or it could be a very different part of the world. It could be North America, uh, India, et cetera. So it'd be great to, in the chat, if you could jot down your name and where you're dialing in from. Scott, Melbourne, welcome. Auckland, Brisbane, Monique from Sydney. Hello, Monique. Argentina, there was one. Argentina. Fran, yeah. welcome, Fran, Argentina. Philippines. Philippines. Tweed Heads, beautiful spot, Jack. Andrew, another Andrew from Melbourne, welcome. Pierre from Vietnam, very warm welcome to you, Pierre. Yes, yeah, great. Lovely, lovely spot. I think we had, a, I think we had about uh, yeah, 13 different countries in the registration, so it's, uh, it's wonderful. India, very warm welcome to you. Sarah from Melbourne, very, very warm welcome to you. It's the, uh, it's the beauty of, the beauty of uh, Zoom, isn't it? Webinars, there's some, some downsides, but there's, there's plenty of upsides. So, and Maria from Mexico. Oh, Maria, welcome. Very warm welcome. Uh, maybe if you, could, if you could put in there what, what times, times uh, <laughs> like. Well, well I'll <laughs> yeah, Mexico is around about uh, 6 p.m. There you go. Yeah. Thank you for joining us, Maria. Looking forward to having you part of our part of our conversation. Seven p.m. There you go. You spot oh, on. Sorry, there now. I hope I hope uh, we're not interrupting your your dinner dinner time. And at five thirty in India. Well, thank you very much for making the time. That'll be a.m. There you go. That's that's a that's a very early start. So wonderful you can join us. AM. Yes, it's a it's a nice early start. So that's right. how I know, I know the uh, I know the times roughly around the world now because with these zooms you need to know. <laughs> yes, you've, uh, you've done a few. Sort of <laughs> Graham's joining us from Sydney, and Claire and I, who we'll introduce in a second, are from uh, Melbourne. So Claire's in CBD and I'm in, in Bayside. So very good. Well, I, I think we'll kick it off. It's in still a, rolling in there. I notice you've got 38 at the moment uh, and more yes. to come. Sorry. Yep. Not a problem. We'll give it 30 seconds or so, I reckon. Mm. Welcome, Joanna from Melbourne. Great that you could join us. Welcome, Con. Welcome, Sue, Monique, Victoria from Sydney. There's a few from Sydney there, Graham. Oh, good. <laughs> and Steph from Brisbane. Uh, amazing uh, spread. Absolutely. Very good. So I think we, uh, we might kick it off. Um, there's a few more joining us as, as we go along. So again, a, a very warm welcome to you all uh, to our uh, webinar, live webinar, uh, today, why strategy should be discovered, not developed. And before we introduce uh, our guest today, uh, just a, a brief bit of housekeeping uh, and to set the scene. So today is really, we really want to make it conversational and interactive. Uh, we've, we've all no doubt attended plenty of webinars with, with many slides. Uh, so today is the only only few slides we have is the, this one you can see now, and then a, one or two at the very end with some educational resources um, that we'll be sharing. Uh, so we'd love for you to to contribute with questions uh, in the Q and A function um, or the the chat. 
Um, I might introduce um, Claire. Claire, welcome. Claire's going to be Claire's from Foundstone. She's going to be manning the the chats and the Q and A. Hey Andrew. Hey everyone. So uh, feel free to put your questions into the into the Q and A uh, feature or into the chat function there, and Claire will, will pick that up. So in terms of uh, setting the scene, just before we before we get on to introduce uh, Graham, Foundstone Conversations. We've been running this for a couple of years now. Uh, we're really about having raw, unedited conversations on all things strategy. There's a lot of uh, theory, textbook theory out there, and perhaps complicated frameworks on this mystical topic of strategy. So we're having these conversations to really cut through a lot of the noise uh, and bring on guests such as Graham to, to share their own uh, uh, lived experiences and their own real life stories. Uh, so it's essentially about a genuine community where we want to share perspectives. Uh, we've, we've launched um, a YouTube and a podcast series, which we'll share if you wanted to, to join that conversation at the end um, and a few more educational resources. So without further ado, I'd like to introduce our special guest today, uh, Dr. Graham Kenny. Very warm welcome, Graham. Oh, thanks very much, uh, Andrew, and uh, welcome to all the people who have got up early or stayed up late. Uh, really looking forward to this session. Thank you. Fantastic. It's great to, great to have you on. So just a brief bit of context of Graham to our audience today. Many of you would have, would have known Graham. Um, from some of his articles out there. Uh, Graham is, is really known in Australia as Australia's number one uh, author and speaker. Um, most of you probably would have seen his, uh, many of his articles from Harvard Business Review. I think what, when I first saw a few artic articles from Graham many years ago, um, he caught my eye in terms of how practical um, his writing was. He gets to the point pretty quickly. Um, and a lot of it is based on real life stories. So today we're gonna, we're gonna be hearing a lot of them, which is gonna be really interesting. Uh, Graham has been a professor of management in the universities across the US and Canada. He's written five books, which we might hear a bit more about today. Um, and as importantly, he's run uh, various businesses across the US, Canada and Australia. So bl brings pr plenty of real world, world experience. And I think having those three different perspectives, um, the academic perspective, uh, the real life perspective of running organizations, and also now running consulting and education really is, is a unique, unique thing. Uh, Graham currently heads up Strategic Factors, a management consultancy based out of Sydney, and also KMS Education, who are specialists in strategy education. And there's a few, um, few resources we're gonna be sharing at the end as well. Graham's really accessible on LinkedIn. You might've seen um, some of his um, posts on there. So I know he, he gives back a lot to our community. So, so thank you again for that, Graham. No problem. So before we kick it off, we wanted a bit of a, bit of a, a trivia question. Wanted to put it out there. Graham asked a question to Claire and I yesterday in our, in our warm up session. And that question is, uh, when did business strategy first start? So when did it first start? You could go start with the decade or you could have a crack at the actual, this, this specific year perhaps. Now, uh, no Googling. We don't want to ruin with the, uh, not that it perhaps would be on there directly. <laughs> but I've heard Graham talk about this and this is gonna be our opening question. We, we hear a lot about strategy perhaps from a, from a military perspective. Um, here we go. Uh, Stephen, the, from the very first, uh, with the first business. The first caveman traders. There we go, Jack. <laughs> <laughs> I like that. We could read into any, any kind of timing with that, couldn't we? Uh, we probably hear a lot about strategy, the broader strategy uh, from a military perspective, but it's going to be interesting to hear from Graham a bit more. Uh, from Scott, uh, his guess is the 1920s uh, for the theory, which is, which is interesting. Uh, and I suppose, you know, if you separate the word strategy out from business, perhaps that could go, go back a bit further. So uh, as, the, as, as those answers coming in, Graham, we might, we might kick it off with that question to, to do a bit of a scene set. It'd yeah. be great if you could just tell us a bit about from your perspective for when, when it all really started. Well, it wasn't uh, with the caveman. 
Uh, and I am talking about business strategy, not strategy, because strategy itself goes back to the caveman. Uh, but uh, strategos is a Greek word meaning strategy. So it goes back uh, at least to the Greeks and the Romans had a few ideas about strategy as well. So the idea of strategy, uh, it really is married with um, uh, military strategy. But when we come to business strategy, it's uh, not the 20s, not the 30s, not the 40s, not the 50s, but the 60s, which surprises a lot of people. And in fact, I can give the exact year, 1965. Now, that's a surprise to a lot of people because they think that uh, it's been around for much longer, although Claire yesterday said the 90s. Well, anyhow, uh, well, let's get away with that one. Um, but the 60s is an interesting one. I actually have the book here, uh, Surprise, Surprise, Corporate Strategy by Igor Anzov. Now, why can I be so confident in my uh, suggestion that's 1965? Uh, because it's backed up by someone called Professor Henry Mintzberg, who is at McGill University. And he wrote another book, which I just happen to have here, called The Rise and Fall of Strategic Planning. And in that, he co called this book, Corporate Strategy, The Crescendo, because it brought everything together in a formal way. And that's quite surprising, actually, for a lot of people, that it's probably less than 50 years old. Now, what I'm talking about here is bringing it together as a codified method. So there you go, it's 1965. There you go. Fantastic. I wonder if I'm sure Google wouldn't tell us that. So uh, no, no, you. I haven't. I haven't told Google. That's the problem. You see, they don't know. Um, well, thank you for sharing that. I think it sets the scene scene nicely. So our main headline topic that that um, everyone's uh, signed up for: why strategy should be discovered, not developed. Uh, we we had a couple of pre questions actually. I was talking to a guy, and he said, "Oh, is this?" When we're going down to the, the discovery route, is there going to be some self-help here as well? So who so who knows? But it, it certainly is in the context of business strategy. Yeah. So in conventional terms, Graham, a lot of, I mean, I personally was led to believe, and perhaps a lot of the conventional stuff is still around, you know, strategy needs to be developed or created. But uh, you're bringing a bit of a different perspective today in terms of the in terms of strategy being discovered. Can you tell us a bit more about that? Yes, it's um, when I look back on the material like Anzoff's, uh, Porter's material as well, and many, many other books, uh, the suggestion, including the modern uh, strategic management textbooks, the idea of developing strategy is two parts of an equation. You've got the capabilities of the organization here. You've got the changes in the environment here. You put the two together in a, some sort of strategic planning or strategy session, and lo and behold, out comes the strategy for the organization. I've really never seen that work, and I often wondered why it doesn't work. And an analogy I would give you is if you watch a painter do a painting like the one behind you there, Andrew, I can explain how the painter puts the paint on the canvas. Mm. So that's an explanation of painting. I cannot explain how the artist created the artwork. And I think what happens in the textbooks is they explain how it happened, but they don't explain how to do it. And that's why I think you have to go on a different route. It's not a mechanical process. It's not bringing the external to the internal and voila, there's a strategy. And I've had many experiences where, you know, you'd, get to that point and there'd be a deafening silence in the room and you wonder mm -hmm. what just happened. Yes. And it's because I'll go, I, I can expand on this in a minute, but I'll just stop at this point to say, I think that's the way we think about it. The outside, the inside and suddenly strategy uh, jumps out at you. Mm. So I just think we need to move on from where we have been. And there's a number of changes that are occurring, which I can go into that I think have just made that uh, obsolete. Yeah, that's really interesting. And can you tell us a bit more from your experience, you know, coming from those those sort of three varied experiences, you know, from an academic angle, from, you know, running organisations, and then from, a you know, now running education 
um, courses around strategy. Can you share with us a bit about your own experience with that over the years and perhaps, you know, how you've realised from, a, from a, a real life compared to academic perspective, how that's shaped up? Well, I think the uh, how it's shaped up for me, and this is all I can talk about, is that in the academic era, which is about 20 years ago when I stepped out of being a professor of management in the US, came back to Australia, uh, you're really working off textbooks and case studies and you know, that's your knowledge. Uh, then I, after I did left academia, became a manager for a while, turned around a business. Mm. And that's when the lights started to come on. And then working with groups of managers, facilitating their strategy sessions, I realized that what I knew wasn't answering the questions that they were dealing with. There were gaps in the method. Right. So that's when I started to develop my own method in terms of stakeholders and looking outside in and so on. So that that's the way it all developed for me. Uh, and, uh, but, you know, it's the inspiration comes from having knowledge of the theory and then running into situations where you think this isn't working. It's not answering the questions. It's too complicated. There's mm. too many terms, all that sort of thing. Yeah, yeah, okay. And so and from the organisations that you, you have seen in the past and you work with now, What's the general trend you're seeing, you know, Australia globally around organisations and business leaders actually really understanding that concept? Are there still the majority still perhaps on the conventional side or is it, is it, is it shifting slowly or more, more quickly? Um, it's hard to generalise when you haven't done the sort of survey across the globe. Yes. But I would say it's, it's more the conventional, conventional way. And mm. by the way, I've only sort of, come around to this view recently and I've come around to the view because I think there's so much change occurring. If you go back a little bit, if I can just go back a little bit to 1965, when Anzoff wrote his book, computers were new on the scene. Hmm. Uh, we think of the 60s as a time of massive change. It was socially, but it wasn't technically or technologically. Hmm. Computers had come on the scene, but they were data processing machines. They processed accounts and so on. Nothing like what we've got today. The power was lower. They didn't have the connections and all that sort of thing. So when you look at today with new business models, startups occurring everywhere, um, social media, and all these things that are happening, including this pandemic, when you get a group of managers together and say, well, where do you think we ought to go? Because that's the development approach. Mm, Let's get in yes. a room and knock this out. There's usually a deafening silence. And it's because they're working all the time inside the organization. So just to paint a picture of what I'm talking about here, it's conventional for annual, for groups of managers, CEOs and the executive team to get together each year to consider their strategic plan. Uh, there's nothing wrong with getting together to consider your strategic plan, and it should be ongoing. We can go into that as well, rather than once a year. The noise in the room is fantastic. You talk about the analysis, you talk about the industry changes, you talk about the trends in the industry, it's fantastic. And then you say, well, where do you think the organization should head? And that's what I mean by the deafening silence, because there's, so many variables occurring. So what I advocate is this, and this is the difference between development, which is what I've just painted, and discovery. Discovery says, we don't know. The groups look at each, should look at each other and rather than pretend they know, say, we haven't got a clue. We don't <laughs> know where we're going. Yes. We don't know which way we should go. Who are we gonna ask? Let's go out and ask some of the stakeholders. So this is what I advocate. Instead of trying to nut it out in the room, get the customers, the consumers, the employees, the shareholders, the suppliers, wherever they might be, go and talk to them mm. and say, what are you looking for from an organisation like ours today? And listen to what they say, collect it. I've got you know, forms that I use in terms with clients to collect this stuff. And when you collect it all and lay it out, you go through it like a 
forensic scientist or a detective at a crime scene. I said that to a group the other day. They thought it was pretty funny that their organisation was a crime scene. Um, but it goes through it like that, and you're looking for clues, you're looking for clues, and you do find them. You mm. just got to you got to you got to believe in the process. You will find clues, and the clues can be suggestion about a new product, a change in your service. It can be uh, the emphasis on one thing versus another thing. So that's what I mean by discovery, going out there and doing it yourself, asking the questions, rather than sitting inside a room and developing from, you know, as a group of executives. And that's a total mindset change. Yeah, that, that's a brilliant way you put that. I like the analogy, the detective looking for clues, because I'm sure people, many people could relate to that, both, <laughs> both inside and outside different industries. So that's fascinating. So it is, so it's largely, a, what I'm wanting to hear is largely starts with a mindset perspective of understanding that we don't have to come up with all these ideas in yeah. these two days yeah. within our four walls. Yeah. Do, do you see that uh, in terms of it's actually leaders actually understanding that that's actually a good thing? Because we see many leaders that put the pressure on themselves to say they have to have all the answers. Yeah, that's right. And that's the problem. And, it, you know, I don't know about you, but when I was uh, in my early career, you know, when you're a junior in an organization, and this is great that you actually have this experience, you looked up to the managers and said, well, they must know all the answers. That's why they're managers. What we now realize is they don't have all the answers, uh, but they are in positions of authority because they need to manage relationships and processes and so on. But that's a very different thing from knowing the direction of the organization or what the direction should be. So what you realize is that managers don't have all the answers. And in many cases, they don't have many answers at all when it comes to external relationships where the organization should head. Now, if, you re if I realize that, it's then incumbent on the managers to also have some humility mm. to say, you know, we don't know the answers. And the other thing is the CEO should say, it's okay for us to say, we don't know. We're employed to run the organization, not to have all the answers about the future of the organization. That's a very different, different situation. And so if you had a CEO that said, look, it's okay to say, we don't know. It's okay for us to down tools and go and do some investigation. But let's not kid ourselves that by improving marginally on what we already do, uh, that that's strategy. Mm. Yeah, love it. There's a, there's a comment here from Ken uh, in, in comments. Thank you, Ken. I don't know, but I'll find out. Yes. Spot on. Yeah. I think, it's, I think things are a nice way to put it. And I think, Graham, I mean, many, you know, we've got CEOs and leaders on, on the call today. And in, from what we see in terms of is, like you put it, having the humility that we don't have the answers is, is a really refreshing thing to her to hear off someone like you, because you've got the academic background, you've run businesses, you're now running the ed education. So to hear that, I think it's reassuring for a lot of people because they they probably haven't even heard that perspective at times. They have the pressure to have to have all the answers. So really appreciate you sharing that. There's another point about getting the answers here too, Andrew. Uh, and I'm thinking about a client in the US at the moment. I'm working with them from Sydney and they're in the US. And what I've had their executives do is to do the interviews. Now, that's an important point. You don't want filters between the, your interviews and the executive. So if the executive said, oh, we don't know, let's go and employ the market research company XYZ to go and do the interviews or send out some questionnaires, it's all been filtered. You're not getting discovery. You're not getting that first-hand experience. And you're not hearing it from the consumer that says the reason I'm not buying your product is. Mm. And it's very important to hear the stories, the uses of the product. Uh, the applications that went wrong or the ideas for a new product. You know, I'm a, I'm a customer. 
the, th the three of us are customers. And don't we always go around saying, wouldn't you think they'd have dot, dot, dot? How come they haven't supplied X, Y, Z? Wouldn't you think they've thought to do this? So we're all the time coming up with ideas as to how an organization can improve its product or service. And what we're really doing, if you examine it, is we're designing the strategy for the organization. Now, if I tap into that as an organization, as a group of managers, I am now listening to the clues about what could be done. I'm never going to find that out by sitting inside the office and sitting in a room at an annual strategic planning session, looking at each other, because we've just left the office, which is all about running the operations, keeping the machine, which is what an organization is fundamentally, a machine taking an input and producing an output, mm -hmm. uh, running that machine efficiently is very different from knowing from the outsider's point of view, the next steps. Yeah. And we're all the time inventing the next steps when we go on a plane, you think, why wouldn't they give you free food? Why would they charge you two bucks? I'm already paying $200 for this flight. You know, that type of thing. And, yes. and everyone on the plane is probably asking the same question. Yes. It's never going to get through to the, the plane operator because they look at the cost. You know, there's just a different perspective. Mm. And to give you another example, this American firm, which distributes uh, industrial products in the oil and gas industry, when they did the interviews, the distributors said price is really important. They went to the end users and they said the price is not important. Now, I'm exaggerating a little bit here, but the, the, what they said was, in the oil and gas industry, reliability of product is extremely important. Price is pretty low down on the list. But the distributors are telling the manufacturer, oh, you need to match the imported product on price. Now, that's a discovery because what we've now found is there's wiggle room on price and branding and positioning. Whereas before, what the company was looking at was a, basically a dead end on price. Hmm. Now we've gone that next step, which you, they used to engage with the end user. They've gone, we've gone to the next step and the end user has told us a totally different story. And now we've got wiggle room, as I say, about pricing, positioning, sales reps going out there, talking up the brand. It's quite, quite interesting. So there's hope where there was previously no hope. Yeah, That's really what I'm like talking it. about. That's a discovery. Really like it. There's a couple of comments and there's a question here on the on the chat. Uh, just comments from from Frank. You know, very reassuring to hear exclamation mark. So thank you for sharing that, Graham. Uh, I know Frank's the CEO uh, within Australia. Um, Con, you know, too many CEOs step back from the customer interface and rely on the ELT to provide insights. And perhaps that's similar to your example there of getting a third party to do that. There's a question here uh, from Indrajit. Um, he really liked the description of discovering as opposed to what happens. <clears throat> and the question, can scenario building play a part? Because sometimes stakeholders are not uh, clear about their needs, or I think their own needs. So scenario building, um, I suppose it's, it's a pretty broad term as well, um, in terms of helping stakeholders understand their needs. Is there any comment from you on that? Um well, scenario planning is something that's been around for some time, since the 70s with Shell, I think around about 75. Um, it's, a good, it's a good tool to look at scenario planning, uh, broad scenarios around what might be the case um, in the future. I don't see any difficulties with that. And, uh, you know, co consumers can't invent product. You know, so this... Innovation comes two ways. There's innovation from within and then there's innovation from outside. So someone will come up with a phone. I mean, I could say as a consumer, it'd be great if I had a phone in my pocket, but actually doing it, got to go over to the, to the organisation. Now, I don't know where the idea of a... Actually, we do know where the idea of having a phone on our wrist came from. It was a comic magazine called Dick Tracy. 
So <laughs> it wasn't the dick, it wasn't the technologist that came up with that. It's some fancy idea in a comic that said, it would be great if we had a phone on our wrist. We've now got there. But it was a customer that came up with the idea. Um, <laughs> there you go. But anyway, back, back, to, back to scenario planning. I think that's a good idea. Mm -hmm. uh, and I think that's another tool that you, you can certainly use. Uh, there's a, some problems with forecasting in the future too far ahead. Any CEO will tell you that because invariably the scenario that you plan out doesn't often pan out. Um, so, uh, but yeah, nothing wrong with doing that. You know, when you look at, we talked about this last night in a group. If you take Australia, for example, after the Second World War, there's quite a lot of manufacturing, but it was very heavily subsidised and tariffs was were as high as 30%. Manufacturing in Australia today is 6% of GDP. It was at one stage around about 30%. But it only got to 30% because of subsidies. It's now down to 6% of GDP. And a lot of people in manufacturing are wringing their hands and saying, okay, well, what are we going to do? How are we going to get manufacturing back up to that level? Now, I don't think it ever will. What's going to happen though, and this is scenario planning for you, is we've already seen where the money's coming from is from uh, digital. And we have some of the uh, unicorns in Australia that are making global impact, Afterpay, Atlassian, Canva, and all these. We've become now a center for a lot of these innovations. And that will go through its phase, and then there'll be another set of innovations, which will be coming on with different forms of computer processing and so on. So, yes, yeah, so I think scenario planning is a good thing to map into that. That's broad range, where are we heading? Hmm. But often what I'm talking about really is much more, more sort of three out three years, hmm. yes. three to five years, which is what we normally do in these sessions. Mm -hmm. And I think, you know, the, the idea of sitting in a room as a group of managers and thinking you've got the answers, it's gone. Yes. Very good. I'm, I'm going to derail my own questions because there's some good Q&A coming in, which I might ask now if it's okay, Graham. Perfect. Uh, Jonathan here, uh, I know he's a, he's a CEO in Melbourne. He, he's asking a question. So I concur that we don't have all the answers. Keen to hear of some approaches you might have used to secure the answers from your team around you. So I think Jonathan's there, to, you know, referring to his own staff and his own team. So would you have, have any comment on, on that? I think anyone within an organisation, whether they be the CEO, senior executives or further down in an organisation is still uh, within the organisation. And that's an impediment um, because you do lose that ability to look at the organisation outside in. And um, now I'm not talking about process improvements here. What was it, Frank, was it? Uh, it was Jonathan. Jonathan. Jonathan I'm not yeah. talking about process improvements, Jonathan. I think process improvements are a totally different thing. This is where you would ask people, do you think we can improve the efficiency of our manufacturing, that type of thing? Obviously, that has to come from within, and we should be uh, asking people for it for suggestions in that respect. I'm really talking about changing our competitiveness, which is about quality of product, customer service, range of products, uh, price, et cetera. So those are the sort of external things that I'm talking about here. But I reckon as an executive, and I think you probably most people would agree with this, that after about three months within an organization, you cannot see it the way the outsider saw it. So when you first join an organization, look around and you think, why are they doing this? Why are they doing that? How come they're doing this? And then after three months, you think, well, that's the normal thing. You've lost the ability to see it from outside in. And um, so you've got to get that perspective renewed all the time. That's brilliant. Thank you. And I'm going to keep going to the questions because I'd rather answer questions from, from the audience. So Pierre's asking, um, how do you motivate all executives to go and listen to customers rather than just the ones related to business, sales, and marketing? Yes. So, hmm. Yeah, and that's an interesting point about sales in an organisation because sales are the people who, after all, have contact with customers. Uh, my daughter's in sales. Um, 
And so I see that she's all the time preparing proposals and they're looking at targets and how they're going to get the numbers. So it's very much about um, having a product or a service and then trying to meet targets. So it's limited in its ability to be far ranging in terms of the future. It's more about how can we get the targets about what we currently do. Whereas what I'm talking about is, and that's a good thing to do, I'm now talking about now where should we be in some years time? What, how should we, de, how should we design the organization in order to get there? And that's when I say you need to go outside. So there are functions within an organization that are more customer facing than others, but wouldn't it be great if the HR manager went out and did some interviews of customers? Wouldn't it be great if you know the finance guy had to go out and sit down with consumers and say, how do you really use this? You know, because some of these people haven't actually met a consumer. Well, so yes. I think it, and that would bring a lot of interesting conversations around that table. And, and, and I think having it firsthand is really important because mm. as I said before, if you get a market research company to do it and they do have a function, I'm not saying you shouldn't use market research companies, but if I ask someone else to do the interviews and they report back to me that he said or she said, it's already filtered. You haven't sat there and saw the emotion. It's a, it's a really powerful thing. Now, you don't need a lot of these. And I'll tell you how many you need. About 12. Now, you go, wow, well, how come? This is how it works. Once you get to a point where you start to hear the same material, you've done your bit. I can't tell you how many that will be. It's called saturation. So saturation is I start by interviewing, say, a, a customer. And I, and I start to hear, I ask them, you know, how did you make a decision to purchase from us or whatever it might be? And then I have all that jotted down. And then I go to another one. And I go to another one. And I go to another one. And if I get to about 12, you're probably going to say, oh, I think we've heard this before. Bring all that into the organization and uh, sit down and look at it. So you look at your customer base, you look at your supplier base and so on. So it's not massive amount of time here. We're not talking about hundreds of interviews. Once it's a, just bear in mind this idea of saturation, which is when you heard it before and down tools finished. I think that's a, that's a really practical point because many people wonder, do I have to do hundreds or thousands? Of <laughs> so the quality is... So I'm you got to get work done, is it? That's right. That's right. So I think it's, it's really practical. Thank you for sharing that. Um, I'm going to continue asking the questions because I'd rather leave mine to the end if we have time. Yeah, uh, great. Lucy, Lucy asked a really interesting question. I know, Lucy, you put on the chat there in terms of the detailed future plans are great, although the relevance is questionable, especially when we hit a global pandemic, exclamation mark. I'm sure we can all relate to that. Um, and then Lucy asked a question, and it's similar to um, Ken. I noticed your, I haven't forgotten about your question in terms of Ken asked the questions, are you describing voice of the customer as a way to gather those questions? Now, I'm going to combine that with, with the question from Lucy as well. Um, any insights on articulating and measuring outcomes in a, in a government perspective? Uh, so... I think that the first question, you know, Ken, in terms of the voice of, custom, voice of the customer, what's your view on that? And is that relevant? And then in terms of gathering insights, is there anything from a government, government perspective you've seen? Well, let's deal with the second one first, because I'm not quite sure what he means by voice of the customer. I know, that, I know the term. I'm not quite sure what he's referring to there. But uh, Lucy, was it in government? Yes, yeah, Lucy. Smith. Yeah, Lucy. Uh, this, these techniques I'm talking about, this method, this approach, this uh, way of looking at an organization applies to all organizations. It applies to business, it applies to government, it applies to small business, large business, churches, schools, hospitals, you name it. It's exactly the same approach all the time. So once you understand it, once you appreciate it, uh, then, you know, you just uh, run with it. So one of the reasons why I developed my own approach, Lucy, is because 
when I started to stand up in front of audiences and run my seminars, I found in the audience there were a mixture of participants. Uh, some were uh, from the business sector, some were from government, some were for, from the not-for-profit sector. And yet all the material I was a, had at my disposal was American uh, customer-oriented material from the private sector, for the private sector. So it wasn't really my, meeting my needs, nor the needs of the audience. And that's when I started to think about stakeholders. So in other words, I needed something that was general enough to cover all organizations. And the first step in any strategy process, well, one of the early steps, apart from analyzing your industry, is this question, who are our key stakeholders? Who are our key stakeholders? Now, You've got to be able to address that, come up with an answer. And I've got five questions I go through. There's an article in the Harvard Business Review that I've written about this. And that is so important because if you don't know who your key stakeholders are, you can forget having an effective strategic plan because it has to, the plan itself is about positioning the organization with respect to each of those groups. So you've got to be able to say, this is, this is where we stand with customers. This is where we stand with consumers. This is where we stand with employees. This is where we stand with suppliers. This is where we stand with the shareholders. So that's a design idea. Now, how you come to the design is what I'm talking about. One way is to sit in a room and try and nut it out, which is development. The other way is to say, well, we'll do a bit of that but we'll also supplement it by talking to those groups and finding out what their answer is. So that, that's on that, Lucy. That's, so in other words, this method applies and should be applied to all organizations. Uh, not quite sure of the voice of the customer. If he, he could elaborate, that would be helpful. Oh, I think I can, just reading the chat, I can say voice of the customer is in the US as used at one time by the US PS and is a channel which the customer base can communicate directly with the organization. You've already dealt with some of this, so thank you. Okay. So I, I think I'll move on to, um, Martin asked a really interesting question here uh, in the chat. Um, Martin's a big fan of Simon Sinek and so, 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 so am I, uh, Martin. Martin makes a statement, then a bit of a question, you know, do you think too many organizations and execs focus on, on the what rather than the why? Um, and then my, Martin makes a comment, I think the why sets the scenario for genuine discovery. And I know, Graham, you're speaking on, I think you mentioned on, on purpose to an organization in the US next week or the week after. So was there any comments in terms of, you know, the why in relation to the discovery aspect? Uh, yes, the why, it's an, it's, I'm, I'm smiling because there's a lot of stuff out there on purpose. I've got about five books on purpose. I've written two articles in the Harvard Business Review on purpose. My most popular article of all, surprisingly, is about purpose. And uh, um, the idea of purpose is, it's a little confused, actually. I'm sort of hesitating a bit here because... I, think, I don't think we've got this quite sorted out. So some people say that your purpose statement should reflect what you're providing to your customers. And there is some truth in that. So in other words, if you're an employee of an organization and you're working in a hospital, say, then your purpose is to help patients get better. Now, that's a, that's a direct relationship from employee to customer, in that case, patients. Other people write very broad statements around, um, you know, making the world a better place. And um, some of them are too broad, I think. Then I'm a little bit concerned about organizations that produce pretty unhealthy food <laughs> and claim they're 
uh, they're improving the health of the organization, uh, not the health of the organization, the health of their consumers. I'm thinking about over-processed breakfast cereals of certain manufacturer name. You might say, is this doing me any good? Uh, and their purpose statement, and no names mentioned here, is about bringing the family together at the table. So they don't want to mention the health part. So, you know, I just, uh, I think there's, I think there's some work to be done. I think it's very good that we have purpose statements. Uh, linking a purpose statements to strategy uh, is, is a little tricky because I think sometimes they're, uh, they're not anchored. So I can have a purpose statement sort of, let's fix the world. And then you come down to, well, now what we want to do is to see how we're going to be effective with our stakeholders. There's quite a gap between the two and others have commented on that gap. So, but I think it's also interesting without going into too much of the theoretical side of this, we're now asking employees to find purpose by looking after customers. So do customers need to find purpose by looking after shareholders? And mm. aren't employees, don't they have a right to find a purpose in terms of their own outcomes? Like I go to work, is it actually to improve the, the lives of customers or where does my life fit in, in terms of purpose? So I think there's this corporate purpose. I'm talking around the subject a bit here because I think it's a subject that I haven't quite- it's Helpful, Graham. thank you, yeah. I haven't quite sorted out and I do see a lot of it out there. Definitely the question of why is important because people are motivated by those questions as to, you know, why do I get out of bed in the morning? Um, is it because I want to go to work and do something that's meaningless or do I want to go to work and do something that's meaningful? But all work has meaning. And uh, sometimes it's up to the senior, well, it is up to the senior management to articulate what that meaning is. And depending on the level in an organisation, it becomes harder to see that meaning. You know, it's all right for a group of executives to sit around and write a purpose statement. But if you're down there cleaning the toilets or you're down, down there mucking out the, the pig pens on a farm, <laughs> they're thinking, hang on, you know, yes. I'm not quite connected to that corporate purpose <laughs> up there. Um, so I think, look, the answer is, short answer, without going into too much detail because I have already, uh, the short answer is I think it's a great idea to try and articulate why. The question is, whose why is it? And also, I think at the corporate level, be careful that you don't write a purpose statement that everyone has a laugh about because it's just too stupid and not connected with what you're really doing. I mean, how could a cigarette company write a purpose statement? Mm. I mean, you know, what's, it, what's their purpose? Yeah. <laughs> I, yeah, I hear no, well, well, I think, yeah, the, the, the employee finding their own, own individual purpose in the context of the organisation, as you put, is really helpful. I'm going to continue. Joanne makes a comment, which and Pierre has agreed uh, to sh in sharing that view. Um, and I think it's the broader conversation we've been having. So it's, it seems this approach lends itself well to the evolving nature of the market and therefore underpins the evolving, ongoing discovery nature of strategy development rather than a once and done approach. Is, it, is that a fair conclusion, question mark, from, from Joanna? Thank you for the question. I think it sums up. Uh, yeah, I can comment, comment on that. It's a very good comment. So Joanna, uh, what I'm suggesting here is that um, by all means get together, you know, once a year to pull everyone together to have that bit of free time, the uh, a bit of space that you can think about. How did we go over the last 12 months? Where are we going from here? I think that's valuable, uh, but I'm not suggesting that you should only do that once a year. I'm suggesting that that then becomes a regular review. So strategy design, which is the term I prefer to use, um, is, um, is a journey, not a project, a journey. That's a, so it's not a project, it's a journey. And so it's about going along and looking at how things are evolving. So each month, I would suggest uh, revisiting the strategic plan or each quarter, if that suits you better, and then saying, okay, well, how are we going against this? Uh, see, there's three elements to any strategic plan, three basic elements. 
the first element is objectives. What are we achieving to, for each of those groups? So if you've got sales targets, you've got profit targets, if you've got engagement targets for employees, whatever it might be, that's the objective side. The strategy is the second bit and the third bit is action. They're the three fundamental elements of any strategic plan. Now, the first bit, as I've said, is the objectives, and you do that stakeholder by stakeholder. The second bit is the positioning of the organization. And the third bit is the action, which is what people are going to do to implement those positions. And that's how simple it, you can make it. Now, the trickiest bit in those three is strategy, because people get mixed up between action, objectives, and strategy. So objectives are what we're trying to achieve as an organization. I always have to put that in. Actions is what we're doing as an individual to implement the strategy, which is the position of the organization. People mix up position of the organization with action, and then they end up with no strategy. So to give you one example, Bunnings is a big hardware uh, chain in Australia. They sell They've got big warehouses. It's like Home Depot in the United States. And they say their position on price is they will not be undercut on price. And that's, uh, that's a position statement as an organisation. There are other position statements that uh, uh, you, you can see in terms of service or quality. You know, Toyota is very clear on quality where they stand on quality. And it doesn't matter what it takes to maintain that quality. If it means recording 3 million cars, they will do it because they will stand on that. So this is, this is important that you have that. Where do we stand as an organization on quality, on service, on whatever it might be? And that's for customers, but you've got to do it stakeholder by stakeholder. And when you've mapped that all out, that's called a strategic plan, but it's not static. Very good, thank you. I'm conscious of time. I think we'll, we'll um, maybe one, 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 probably one or two more questions, and we'll finish it up. Uh, yeah, Lucy commented in terms of what you described there, in her uh, opinion as well, in terms of strategy helping you make decisions when things change, and I think that sums it up nicely as well, Lucy. So thank you for that. Uh, um, Joseph here um, asked a question, a, a bit of a statement as well. Uh, what you're explaining sounds similar to design thinking applied to strategy in a, in a similar way. Um, do you see, do those methodologies apply across the discovery process you're explaining? Uh, and are there any differences in your view um, from a design thinking perspective? Um, yeah, I think that's a fair comment. And design thinking though does tend to draw on the participants within an organization. Uh, so you have a group coming together and all the various methods that you know from design thinking. Um, I always think that's a bit limited because, again, you're appealing to the participants within an organisation. There's so many techniques for drawing out employees in these methods. Hmm. There's actually very few techniques for doing it externally, apart from sitting down and having a conversation. But when I do it, uh, or clients do it, under my supervision, if you like, uh, they have a, 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 a form that they talk the respondent through. So it's not just having a chat. Uh, but um, yeah, so it's interesting. So the yeah, design thinking does, from my knowledge of it, my reading of it, because I'm not an expert in it, uh, as a practitioner, that is, um, it does rely a lot on in members of an organization coming up with ideas, prototyping, all that sort of thing. That's where I think its limitations lie, that you're still relying on the internal participants of an organization to come up with new ideas. Yeah, fair question. I think it, if it is applied just to that, there would be a limitation. I know um, Claire Claire's done a fair bit of work um, in, that, in that field and so have I. In term, if, if it's applied externally, I think with the principles that you've talked about, I think it can be quite powerful. I think I'm gonna finish on a question from Stephen. Um, it's a more of a practical question because I wanna to get to it and it's been sitting there for a bit. What sorts of questions should you ask of partners 
as opposed to customers and shareholders. Now, I know you've talked about the broader stakeholders, but is there any comment, comment specifically on partners? Is that program? partners in terms of other organisations or are you talking about partners in a partnership? I believe it's partners in I would interpret that partners in other organisations which you partner with. Yes, yeah, so, okay. So the same sort of questions. They're the same questions, uh, really. In fact, I think you could look at it this way. All stakeholders are partners. You know, they're, it's a two-way street. So this is, you give something to the customer, you get something back. You look after your employees, you get something back. And with partners within a, within a sort of partnering arrangement, within an inter-organisational partnership we're talking about here, each one is looking for something. And to work out what they're looking for is very, very important. It's the same with performance measurement, which is another field that I work in, as you know, Andrew. As I say, performance measurement is about a two-way street. And measuring performance is measuring relationships. Strategy is about relationships. And it's about getting the best you can out of those relationships, but it's two sides. It's not one side. So if you don't give the customer effective service, proper quality at a good price, they'll go somewhere else. You've broken that relationship. Mm. But if you get the relationship right, you grow and prosper. Beautiful. I think that sums it up really nicely. So thank you. Um, I think, Claire, if we could just share the, the last um, one or two slides, if we could, conscious of time. Graham, thank you for sharing you know, a lot of those real experiences. And I think we've just really just started to warm up, haven't we? So I think, um, you know, we're looking to have these ongoing conversations, I think to make, even make them more interactive. Um, so just what we wanted to finish in terms of some of the resources uh, and things you can turn to. Um, again, this is probably a bit of a plug to be honest, but it's really more resources, genuine resources you can turn to. Uh, Graham's organization, KMS, uh, strategy uh, training and, uh, different training around strategy as well. They're holding strategy masterclasses starting on, I think it's the 14th of September, Graham. Yes, that's right. And so they're running running on Zoom uh, remotely, you know, access, accessible anywhere across the world. And as you can see, some of the dates there, uh, uh, both locally and the US, Canada and UK. So uh, feel free to, uh, to jump on to kms.com.au. The landing page is there with all the details. I've, I've, I've attended those courses last year. I got a lot out of them. You know, very practical, interactive questions, perhaps similar today. So I'd, I'd highly recommend it. And from a Foundstone advisory perspective, we, we've launched a Kickstarter recently. And the Kickstarter is really around giving you some IP and some, some ideas, covering a lot of the principles um, of Graham, actually. We've learned from Graham over the last couple of years, those principles that I help you, you know, start to kickstart some of these things in a very, very targeted way. It's not the, the big bang starting again. Um, so you're able to access them um, through, uh, through that link there. So Graham, thank you very much again. I think Claire was gonna put your, your, well, your email there is on, on the, the, the screen. Uh, the LinkedIn, I know you're very active on there. So if you just type Graham Kenny into LinkedIn, um, you're there, I think you've got about 13 or 14,000 followers. So there's, uh, you're very active on there. And then of course our details on, on, on there, um, the chat. Thank you, Claire, for putting, putting that down. Well, so thank, Graham, you. thank you, Andrew. I just want to thank you and Claire, but particularly Andrew in the case of, uh, you know, getting in touch and for getting in touch and uh, organizing, this has been terrific. I've really enjoyed it. Thank you. No, not at all. It's been wonderful. And I think the, and lastly, let's land on, thank you for the audience, people dialing in from all different parts of the world, different time zones, very early, very late. So a really warm thank you to everyone. And the questions have been brilliant. Um, there's one or two we didn't get to. So I think we can, we can answer them directly to those people, or, or I think we might be having a next session. So everyone have a, a great rest of your day, your evening, your morning, wherever it might be and, and stay safe. Thank you. Thanks a lot.